Good afternoon, everybody. I know this is the postprandial hour, judging by the crowd which is there in front of us. But for whoever is there, thank you for coming in to attend this session. session. Our uh, session is on scintillating cases in VR surgeries. Uh, we have a whole uh, uh, August panel here who are very good uh, surgeons, and uh, they will show you some spectacular uh, surgeries uh, for different conditions. And as you all know that retinal surgery is something where it never conforms to the same kind of uh, steps in any given case. Many a times you have to think out of the box and that is what helps you in managing the case well. Uh, we would like to start our first, yeah. I would like to start the first series with uh, inviting Dr. Sarvanan. He's going to talk to us on silicon oil as an adjunct in non-magnetic intraocular foreign body removal. Second talk, please. Thank you, madam. Uh, this is just a small uh, uh, surgery, uh, two surgery series on uh, some uh, new tricks in uh, foreign body removal. So I just, this is the first case was an eight-year-old boy who came to us with a, a secondary infection following a bone arrow injury. He had a severe uh, uh, vision loss with the uh, inflammation in the anterior segment as well as vitreous exudates. Filled, the whole vitreous cavity is filled with the severe vitreous and vitreous exudates. And uh, otherwise normal. He had an initial uh, conoscleal tear repair just next to the limbus. And in spite of the surgery, he was deteriorating and that's why he was referred to a hospital. So the ultrasound showed some uh, small uh, uh, high intensity echoes because we are cut as a, it was not very clear what sort of foreign body it was. But from the history, we are not very sure whether what, what went inside, but we were stick because we were not able to identify the exact uh, length of the stick from the ultrasound. So this is how the foreign body is located. It was where the superficial star was sutured. The long piece of foreign, uh, foreign body is sticking from the limbus where the injury had happened and was hitting the uh, retina just nasal to the disc. You can see the corotatomy in process, there's significant vitreous exudates. And you can see that now the, uh, there's a stick there. It is in, in sort of incarcerated between the anteriorly, between the, from the sclera, posteriorly onto the retina. That's the site of entry where the suturing was done earlier. So it's a long and uh, uh, non-magnetic foreign body. That's the main issue here. So you can see sort of, uh, oh, sorry. So that is the foreign body there and we can see now it is just, we are, I am just lifted it from the retinal incarceration here and freed it from the posterior ad addition. It is still anchored to the anterior uh, uh, scleral uh, area. So I am trying to access it from the opposite side of entry. So we are making a large sclerotomy there to uh, avoid uh, using the same entry point because it is not easy to remove through the same entry point and because it is already sutured. So I, to prevent it from falling down and causing further retinal injury because already the nasal retina is injured. So what I am trying to do here is doing a fluid exchange and injecting oil into the vitreous cavity. So my uh, uh, logic is that oil will be more viscous and it will uh, keep the foreign body in place even if my uh, forceps uh, slips off. You can see this is the uh, Makimer uh, uh, two-prong forceps here, foreign body forceps because it's a large foreign body. Routine forceps do not work well. And that is the uh, forceps in place now. So I'm holding the uh, stick and trying to remove it. But you can see that it slips off. But even if it slips off, you can see that foreign body is not falling down. The reason being that the high viscosity of the silicon oil which is inside. So here I'm using silicon oil as an adjunct to prevent retinal injury in case the foreign body falls, in a, especially in a non-magnetic foreign body. So I'm trying to go inside again and grasp the foreign body with the same forceps. And now this is the foreign which is coming out right now. I'm trying to extend the sclerotomy a little bit to prevent a repeat fa falling of the foreign body. And using the cyclospatula to sort of uh, mobilize the foreign body to, for easy exit. So that's the first case where we removed a, a long uh, a stick from the uh, intra intravitreal space. So Second case is a 21-year-old male who had a history of, uh, he, was, he was drunk at that time, so he was not sure how he really got injured. So he came with a secondary infection and panophthalmitis, in fact, and no pale vision. And the CT revealed a large foreign body was seen in the vitreous cavity. 
and it was uh, totally panophthalmitis with severe uh, uh, orbital edema proptosis and everything it was not responding to routine therapy with the intravenous antibodies intravital antibodies so finally decided to go on even the media was even though media was very hazy we thought we'll make a, a try to go and remove this so this is the uh, after uh, removed all the superficial extrudates there was a lot of bleeding inside put in air then only i was able to identify it was actually a short uh, yar gun uh, pellet which was uh, used for i don't know how he got injured he was not uh, really aware how he really got injured because he was drunk at that period of time and you can see the very heavy foreign body with a lot of bleeding and uh, significant extrudation in the vitreous cavity so same technique we are using here after i'm just putting in oil to fill up the vitreous cavity now this is the uh, uh, bapai uh, claw forceps i'm using the bapai claw forceps and the oil was keeping the blood from mingling um, uh, into the vitreous cavity and causing bit, uh, bit, uh, loss of bit, uh, clarity vision and you can see that uh, now i have grasped the uh, argan pellet and i am trying to remove through the uh, scleral superficial scleral tunnel here so this uh, i can see now it is coming out using the macpherson forceps i am grasping the uh, argan pellet and removing it through the uh, so advantage of putting oil in these cases it prevents uh, bleeding mixing into the if you have a bss going in it immediately causes visual uh, visibility loss and also the uh, when you make a such a large exit wound for the removal of a large foreign body the eye collapses causing difficulty in visualization and also increase in bleeding so oil helps to keep the media clear keeps the uh, globe stable and intact for us to for uh, easy access and removal of the foreign body so we have a lot of other forceps for uh, 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 um, uh, removing of uh, non magnetic foreign bodies and people have used even the ent cro crocodile forceps for removal and we have the uh, basket forceps we have the uh, this is the uh macimer uh, claw forceps you can see it in uh, how it is used to uh, remove this okay it's not playing anyway so this is the bapai claw forceps which is a new addition to our armamentarium so this is the bapai uh, one of the disadvantages of bapai is that when you close the prongs retract so you have to uh, compensatorily move the uh, your forceps forward to grasp the foreign body is one of the negative uh, side effects of uh, uh, using the bapai claw forceps anyway apart from this i uh, just showing that this is a case of a pencil uh, nib lot of large pencil nib in the vitreous cavity two kids were fighting at school and one of them stabbed the eye with his pencil and the pencil got broke you can see how it's very uh, difficult to remove the smooth foreign bodies especially non magnetic foreign bodies it tends to keeping on falling i almost dropped this eight times before i was able to remove it luckily there was no injury to the retina so oil helps to prevent all these bad things from happening so, the, so oil can be used as an adjunct Uh, to prevent both retinal injury maintain the globe intactness as well as keep the media clear when removing non magnetic foreign bodies and it's a very helpful adjunct unlike pfcl it has got a little bit uh, more uh, viscosity so you can see that this is a, a foreign body being dropped in a, a silicon oil and the silica, uh, vitreous uh, routine bss pfcl is a little bit better, uh, hi higher viscous than uh, in between both saline and silicon oil so oil gives you much more better viscosity as to keep the globe intact and that's one thing which you have to keep in mind when you are uh, dealing with the large non magnetic foreign bodies thank you thank you dr sarvanan that was an excellent presentation uh, we just uh, for the benefit of the crowd i would uh, like to direct one question to you that what would be the size of the object which you would think of either taking it out from the scleral root or you would prefer to remove it from the limbus so uh, any large foreign body which is uh, irrespective of size you have to look at the ease at which you can grasp and remove it if you are you are going to force the frequent slippage and falling down every time it falls down picking it up from the retina is going to cause more injury wherever you expect that you are going to have a tough time removing even irrespective of size it's smooth like there was a pencil nib was quite a small foreign body it was very smooth to slipping off now all those cases better to remove through the anterior root handshake technique rather than trying to remove the sclerotomy sclerotomy has got a much higher risk of slippage than than the uh, limbal root another question which i had to you uh, regarding foreign bodies that if you have a glass foreign body in the eye which is not creating a problem within the eye is just lying in one corner it's not causing any kind of problems over there would you remove it or wouldn't you remove it so inert foreign bodies like glass diamond gold can be left inside especially if you fear that especially in eyes with the very good visual potential because if you feel that it is not going to cause issues uh, better to leave it inside especially in eyes with good visual potential dr narish over to you can I ask him anything especially but law says that you have to remove all foreign bodies that's one uh, negative side of leaving it inside 
but in case you leave retain foreign bodies six monthly uh, vision and erg to look for any toxicity toxicity is a must but as per law uh, we are supposed to remove uh, all intracranial foreign bodies is the other side of the coin no in case of a class do you really need to remove it or you can hide it somewhere and leave because it's going to be inert and the collateral damage we get while removing a glass for is much more higher yeah. so should we remove it or we should uh... that's what i was saying if it's visual is in a good visual potential i i would prefer to leave it inside that's what i was saying okay actually we do the surgery to give prognosis in this case to give a good visual prognosis you don't remove you don't do <laughs> yes so in a, a patient with uh, no perception of light uh, with uh, trauma and a young boy with the trace hemorrhage and all would you do a vp and still give them uh, you know the so uh, in a in a operate. severe trauma with no pl i so uh, the uh, people can still regain there are a lot of uh, case series where people have re regained significant vision and vep is not a very uh, good tool to assess visual potential in these size you can can add can give you some information but it's not a like a, a cut off where if it's a vep is poor you don't do it because in vv uh, no no pl eyes especially in severe trauma are not a contra indication for uh, advising no intervention so that is not a contraindication it's actually we have to try to if the patient is willing to go for surgery always go in for surgery don't keep no pl as a contraindication for surgery uh you showed us a wooden foreign body uh, which you removed very 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 effectively and nicely uh in that i he didn't have any kind of major signs of endophthalmitis but if you do remove a, a vegetative foreign body would you put them on some antifungals in the post op period in especially in uh, vegetative but it's always better to uh, put them on uh, antifungals both topical and oral for a short period of time to see and to do if, if it's uh, infection is stop i mean resolving very fast you can stop the medication later on rather than waiting to see if it's getting worse and then starting uh, better to start it in the first stand itself uh, sir uh, do what what difficulty you find while removing uh, this kind of a silicon oil like when the pvd is not complete already the view may be no this is just an adjunct we don't keep the oil uh, we remove it immediately the second case i remove the oil after removing the foreign body okay so do you find any difficulty in in that or just by the active suction you no no because they got a large wound once you switch on the infusion the oil will come up in come 10 on. seconds it will come out actually the ideal oil 5000 or 1000 uh, i don't see much of a difference between 1000 and 5000 uh, to to aid the easy injection and removal i usually use 1000 but you can go for 5000 if you feel it is uh, but it's not a much big difference in viscosity uh, so you were using a simple forceps but you know you have like, this yeah. sir one question go closer to the is there yeah. any iron particle have entered in the uh, eyeball and you know that the iron but the visual potential i you have told that it is to be wise to uh, wait for until unless the erg shows toxicity sir it is uh, always in favorable the follow up of the patients in our government sector those patients are uh, staying in rural villages whether they will come back again always in that situation what the ophthalmologist will do like us sir uh, we are talking about inert foreign bodies like glass diamond gold in those cases you can uh, sort of safely leave even in those cases you'll have to do six monthly follow up with vision and erg to check toxicity but iron because it is magnetic you got lot of uh, good good magnets there you can easily safely remove iron foreign bodies much more easily and iron if you leave inside the risk of sclerosis is considerably high so iron foreign bodies do not leave it uh, inside the vitreous cavity i was talking about inert madam was asking about inert foreign bodies so uh, i was asking about this simple forceps that you were using to remove the pencil uh, thing but do you think that uh, the tip of the pencil with a three prong forcep would have been better to kind of come uh, out we don't have a, a, for recently with the bapai forceps is, is large enough to hold but the previous uh, generation of claw forceps was very small it's not fit enough to hold the large this is actually a, this is not a routine pencil nib it is that uh, this foreign make of pencil where they have a, this attached to a plastic hub So the size of the pencil nib is quite large, unlike routine pencils. So it was very difficult to hold it. Wilson's so, forceps; they had the small. Uh, so prongs. I didn't have the bapai at that time of doing when I was doing this particular surgery. Actually, Manish has helped all, all of us with his bapai forceps. Uh, Doctor Nareesh, you would like to? Uh, I would like to invite uh, our chairperson, Doctor Nareesh Babu, to come and show you certain videos on subretinal gliosis. an unorthodox approach for the removal
check. Oh, thank you, Avoice, and uh, thank you, chairpersons. So we'll be having uh, straight away two uh, videos. <coughs> this is my disclosure. So we all know that uh, subretinal glyphs is quite common in case of chronic retinal detachment, and that hinders the what you call the settling of the Hello, retina. Everyone. Here we so what we do in this case is in the past region, a minimal vitrectomy is done in this case. So case of a chronic retinal detachment, you can see multiple subretinal bands. Extensive subretinal glyphs could be noted in the nasal region so and case, around the disc. Uh, very less vitrectomy. So one of the clues don't do complete vitrectomy because that will settle the retina. So make it so and between 10 to 12 millimeters posterior to the limbus, a new valve the cannula, 25 gauge is preferable. Insert the cannula under the retina uh, and uh, in the subretinal space. Use a max grip forceps, engage the what you call the subretinal band, just remove it. And this is a very easy way to approach. There is no retinotomy, thereby, the migration of the PFCL under the retina is uh, with the mostly avoided. A max grip and uh, even for the nasal or the temporal, if you go temporal, you can reach any of these bands. areas because well, the force of length is quite long. Fourth, so this is the second band finally, which we have removed and there is a napkin ring around, around the disc. The disc. This is the one possible. which is very difficult the when we are removing because we have to do a bit removing retina, all the subretinal bands and that leads to the migration of the PFCL. Once this is done, now you can inject the PFCL, settle the retina and the retinal of glyatic tissues can be dealt with in a conventional way. So this is a case where you can see the preretal fibers, I mean gliosis. Under the PFCL, just uh, you can uh, scrape with the tannols or you can directly uh, pick with the forceps. You can see the membrane coming off. The preretinal membrane. And in most of the these cases, we stain yeah, the preretal gliotic membrane which is removed. And in almost all these cases, we stain under the PFCL with the blue. And we peel the ILM. Once it is done, Usually these cases we go in for two stage in the sense it is uh, filled with PFCL topped up with All silicon the oil we leave the silicon oil for 10 15 days maximum of 15 days and then after that you will release any undue traction the fluid exchange. and for okay, settling so the retina adequately this is the one which i was saying the other technique is because it's uh, Hello, everyone. a blind procedure many people think that you will be having bleeding will be entering into the retina so in that case, you can still go for uh, visualization. So this is another case of uh, gliatic tissue, very minimal vitrectomy is done so that you can have a good scaffold. The retina will not settle. Once this is done, in the supracorital, I mean subretinal space, you can enter with a 25 gauge, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, broker cannula. So you don't enter completely. Yes, just you place the cannula, wait for there, then go with the light pipe. Now you can see what's happening inside the eye. You can see the broker and the cannula inside. Then you gently insert so that you will not be hitting the retina and you will be inside the space. So this is more uh, what you call uh, visualized uh, procedure so you will not be having any adverse event. Once this is done, then you can use the same max grip forceps. Enter into the subretinal space. You can identify the membrane. Just feel the membrane. It comes off in toto. And you don't need to do the thing. So here we have to give the credit to Robert McKimmer, the man who did the vitrectomy. And this technique was done by him way back in 1980s when there were no visualization system, no hi-fi system. So this is the modified version of what Robert McKimmer has done way back in 1980s. So you can find, uh, we peel the membrane in toto once it is done as usual. In this case, I, have, uh, I am now inserting the flute needle in the same space. I want to drain the fluid without making the retinotomy. So this is another advantage which we have started doing now. So I have used a chandelier light also. So this is the fluid, uh, I mean sorry, flute needle under the retina to drain the subretinal uh, fluid. In order to make it complete, in one of the port I put the chandelier so that I can go for bi-manual. So through the cannula, you go with the flute needle. Now you inject the PFCL and whatever the excess fluid in the subretinal, I mean the whatever the fluid there in the subretinal space, it is drained through the flute needle, so without making a retinotomy. So I don't need to do any drainage retinotomy in these cases. Once the retina settles, just uh, remove the preretinal gliatic. It was quite tough, so we have to go for again uh, scissors and the forceps and uh, peel uh, after staining with the BBG under the PFCL you peel the membrane. So in case if the patient is having a subretinal gliotic membrane 
uh, it's very easy to go under the retina and peel rather than making a retinotomy, especially if the patient is having a napkin ring, because there we'll be making a hole adjacent to the disc, and if the retina is not settling and there is every possibility, the PFCL will migrate under the retina, and if it stays under the fovea, it is a real painful thing for the surgeon to see it on the POD one. So without, with this, I would like to thank the, thank the organizers for the opportunity, and I would like to conclude. I would like to take any questions if it is there. Thank you. Dr. Naresh, that was a super excellent uh, portrayal of how to think out of the box, think out of the eye, and go in and remove the subretinal gliotic bands. Uh, the surgery was really nice because it removed all the bands so effectively. But uh, tell us, how did you think of this? Uh, no, no, I, I, I have already box? told. I am. I have not done anything uh, new. Now I started reading all the old articles of 80s and the 70s. So many things which I am doing, which is uh, appearing novel, were done. I, as I told, this procedure was done by Robert McKimmer himself in 1980, and he has published it. It is there in our literature. But only thing is he has done that in the retinal surgery, not in the vitreous surgery. So he has, uh, uh, with the indirect, he has gone under the retina and picked the membrane. Now with the sophistication, we can modify and we say, and because thanks to Robert McKimmer, we won what you call a travel grant of 2,500 US dollars for this video. So the credit goes to Robert McKimmer, not to me. And what about the risk of bleeds, choroidal bleeds? Which one? What about? No, no, no the that's risk? what I am saying. That's what I am saying. Like we have done a lot of cases. Uh, actually, it is like uh, draining our uh, subretinal fluid in case of uh, what you call uh, the buccal surgery. 15711. If we avoid, in the sense of the clock hours, usually it doesn't bleed. Number one. And in fact, uh, uh, that is the point of uh, showing the second video where you can visualize and when, when we are entering. So that you can see it is uh, it's a smooth procedure, so uh, no bleeding as such happens in these cases. Okay. Any other questions from so, anybody? Uh, Welcome, Paritosh. So while Sormen. removing the uh, membrane, uh, do you do the spaghetti technique, like do you twirl the forceps or you just... No, 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 like uh, that, uh, what you call rolling like a noodle, it is no. mandatory in case of uh, when we make a retinotomy. In this case, you gently pull it or you can use the tannus also under the retina and you can scrape so that the membrane gets released. And when we pull, you would have seen actually it doesn't uh, create Nothing any happened. problem. It comes off easily. It's not that uh, densely adherent to the retina. Yes, sir. Yes. So as I have told, don't do much vitrectomy. In fact, nowadays I don't do vitrectomy at all. First to tackle the membrane and do the vitrectomy so that when there is a vitreous, it is not allowing the retina to settle. That way it's fine. And in case if the retina is shallow, we can do one more thing, make the port and through the port, infuse the fluid so that the retina becomes much more bullous. And then you go and approach the membrane. Have you used something like a uh, sodium hyaluronate or uh, uh, under the retina to create that increase. Uh, no, sir. No, 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 no. I think uh, removing helon will be very difficult. But as I have told, we use the same port for draining the subretinal fluid also. Maybe, as you said, in future we can try actually injecting helon. In Thank all you. these cases, do they come out like the way they came out in the first case? One link to the other, the other link to the other. It just came out as one yes. kind of complete sheaf, you know. Yeah. So normally it is like that or many times? Yeah, it is normally like, like that actually. I am not saying this because just I am doing that. It is a very simple procedure. In fact, it is very gratifying also. So it comes in total. It is not an issue actually. Thank you, Dr. Naresh. It was a real visual treat. Uh, now we introduce Dr. Somil. He is another daredevil surgeon who thinks always out of the box and you will see some daredevil surgeries that he has done. Go ahead, Somil. I am sorry to actually no go out of turn because I am, I am shuttling actually between two halls. So, uh, okay. So, I will just play this video and I will be talking as it plays. So, scintillating via surgeries, the take home message being never say never. So, it is a 75 year old female with a central retinal artery occlusion as you see here with a cherry red spot and a whitening of the retina. You see the embolus at the superior and the inferior arteries here as they come out of the optic disc. You see the pulsations and the cherry red spot is very evident. So normally there is no treatment for this, but we decided we'll have a go at it. 
we in, we started by inducing a pvd stain the ilm and peel the ilm in the hope that if you are not able to dislodge the embolus per se we are going to anyway improve the oxygenation of the macula by peeling off the ilm we need to be careful while peeling the ilm as you see the retina here is very edematous macula is boggy and there is every chance of the macula getting caught in the forceps as you are peeling the ilm so after doing that we also peel the peripapillary ilm because we are going to do all our maneuvers on the artery over there in terms of dislodging the embolus the first procedure is decompression what we do is we make the pressure negative inside the vitreous cavity you see the here the disc is lifting up and you also see a choroidal knuckle developing what we do is just keep the vacuum on keep the infusion off and once we do that we hope that the arterial pressure will push the embolus out the second maneuver that we do is straighten the artery we lift or nudge the artery such that it becomes deangulated if you see here you see the movement of the embolus along the artery and as you see the movement of the embolus the good part is that you see the circulation coming in right behind right through so you see here you see this uh, vessel over here you see it getting perfused the moment the embolus passes it till it reaches where it's where it can't really go beyond i'm just going to rewind it and show you in high mag again so we nudge the artery or straighten it so to say and the embolus then travels it is actually like you know just water being let go through a dam and as we see the embolus migrating along the artery we see that the circulation is coming in right through there and the retina getting perfused on table so the same thing happens with the other two two sets of emboli here you see them migrating along two other arterioles and the circulation coming in right there again i'm going to rewind that so if you see in high magnification what i've done is just nudge the artery a little bit gently so to say and dislodge the embolus from there so the third maneuver is actually milking the embolus along the artery if it does not come by nudging all you need to do is press on the artery a little bit and it comes away by nudging this is a cigar shaped embolus and it won't go further because it's caught at the fork you see that the retina is well perfused now visual visual acuity improved to 618 in this patient this next case is very tricky actually you see a pars plana foreign body here you have a clear lens a clear vitreous and 6 by 6 vision you're not going to remove this foreign body without actually messing up the eye either you're going to incur a cataract or you're going to damage the vitreous base incur tears or have a retinal detachment so we decided to follow an alternative approach in what dr karobi just described as thinking out of the box we thought outside the eye and this is what we landed up doing we decided to take an external approach see the clear lens over here clear vitreous 6 by 6 vision we make a superficial scleral flap and uh, then make a deep scleral flap because we decide to approach the foreign body from outside we mark this foreign body beforehand at the pars plana by indentation we see the choroidal knuckle here we cauterize it a little bit make a small nick through it and we go with our magnet so to say blindly and there the foreign body comes out so this is without actually going inside the eye we do a little bit of vitrectomy around there and we suture the deep flap first and then the superficial the reason for making two flaps is that the first flap will act like more like a trap door mechanism this is the last of the series of scintillating cases there is a cataract surgery being done for what you see beneath the cataract which is coats disease where the retina is looking right at you and touching the posterior capsule so we cannot uh, intervene here without doing the cataract so what we did is then put the infusion cannula in and you see here with a 26 gauge needle put around 6 mm from the limbus you see the drainage of the coats fluid that is taking place we are not going really inside the eye and draining the coats fluid externally you see this yellow reflex gradually disappearing as the retina falls back in in place we have a similar second case here where i'm going to be showing you an intraocular intervention again a coats disease where i'm doing a little bit of vitrectomy but because there is no break in the retina the retina is not going to settle we need to do drainage so we put this 26 gauge from here and you see the needle tip entering below the retina here and the positive pressure of the infusion is actually pushing the subretinal fluid out through this needle and after it cannot go beyond a certain point we tend to release the vitreous so that the fluid gets more place to push in the subretinal fluid out this is a cyst here which we have deroofed and then we laser all the telangiectasic vessels it is essential even to laser the ischemic retina beyond for the fear of not causing nvi there is no pvd here yet despite that we do an air fluid exchange to fill up the space and this was an important last step wherein we put avastin at the end so as to close the remaining telangiectasic vessels thank you
That was a lovely bouquet of cases that you presented. Uh, you've left me speechless. I have no questions for you. If the others have, they can ask you or anybody from the crowd. Anyone from the audience who wants to ask anything who about the presentation? Who wants to ask anything? Yeah, so in Coates disease, there is, there is this trend that you give Avastin with Tricot as an injection when you have macular problems. And the reason for me giving Avastin here is because the patient had borderline NVI as well. Not only did I laser the ischemic retina beyond the telangiectasic vessels, NVI would come down with Avastin as well, which is the reason why I did inject it. So, Amil, in your um, CRAO case, do you, how, how high do you raise your IOP when you're going towards, or you, you said you do it in hypotony, no? Yes. Huh? So, so, the first oh. maneuver is to make the eyeball hypotonous and to sit on it for a little while. Sometimes the embolus may not be very evidently seen at the bifurcation like how it was seen here. Because most of the times the embolus is behind the sheet, behind the optic disc sheet, which is the commonest cause for CRAO. So what we assume is that by making the eyeball hypotonous, the arterial pressure is going to push it forwards. It is like doing a dignified form of a digital massage, where we give anti-glaucoma medication to reduce the pressure so as to increase the perfusion pressure. And then we sit on that and do the remaining maneuvers in a hypotonous eye. So, if in case you would have touched the artery or there would have been a bleed or something? Yes, so I do have videos of that as well. If I do end up going through the artery, I get a gush of blood right through the vitreous cavity. For me, I mean for a lot of people, it is very drastic because then you are left with a bleeding artery. But for me, it still works well because it actually pushes the emboli out into the vitreous cavity. And you just sit on that artery for some time, the adventitia is going to clot after some time. The lumen is not going to clot. It's not going to be a re-block. It's just the place where it has gone through that is going to form a clot and the circulation is going to get re-established. So I've had a case, I've not put a video of that, where I've had a bleed, I've just sat on it closing the ports for about five minutes and it has stayed like that well. So once I went in, I could see the clot on the artery and the bleeding had stopped completely. Like how you do in diabetics typically. And, and some, how low do you take the pressure? Pardon? How hypotonous do you make it? How? It should be around 5 millimeters of mercury, if you ask me. But there is no exact way because all the time you are putting the vitrectomy, like the infusion pressure, the bottle height is really low. You cannot really gauge it unless you have a positive pressure system wherein, wherein you can measure pressure. But the bottle height would be at the lowest. And Somal, any timeline to do this surgery? I mean, when you see a CRAO case? So the time is of essence here and even then the results are unpredictable. In my case, I operate the patient within 18 hours and it was very difficult for me to get a cardiac fitness because usually these, these patients have comorbid conditions like heart diseases. So usually anything that you operate less than 24 hours, you assume that the retina has not al already got infected by the time you enter. But there is again no predictability on that. I have operated cases more than three days later and I've got back vision and I've operated some cases four hours from the time of the occlusion and I have not got back vision. A lot of factors are there determining the prognosis depending on where the block is. A lot of the times or majority of the times the block is actually behind the artery which is the commonest site for the embolus. Only in let's say 25% of the cases have I have seen the embolus at the optic disc like how you saw in these cases. So this is, this is, I mean this is the best you can do in a worst case scenario. But if you ask me, the results are not that great. Out of the 15 odd cases I may have done, only two or three would have actually improved in vision. So that should be the take home message to do something when there is nothing else to do. But the eye limb peeling in, um, in an ischemic eye, I mean, do you end up with uh, atrophic retina or holes post op? No. no, not really. So if you see the retina is edematous, but it's only the inner retina. The foveola is as such of normal thickness. It does not get edematous at all because it is the edema of the nerve fiber layer and there is no nerve fiber layer at the foveola, which is the very reason why you get a cherry red spot because the surrounding area is white and the central area, which is non-edematous, is red because of the choroidal reflex showing through. Thank you, Somil. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can rush back for your other session. Thank you now so much. Now we have another... Uh, entrant, Dr. Sangeet Mittal, he's come from one session. Do you go, have to go back to another session? You finished, okay. Anyways, you can come. Do you want to present it now? You can come and present your case. Okay, sure. 
uh, Dr. Sangeet Mittal is going to present his uh, videos on bimanual surgery in PDR. It's time for the arrow. So can I have the audio, please, in this? It, actually, the audio is inbuilt. Eyes of PDR with combined or tractional retinal detachments with extensive fibrovascular proliferation and tabletop configuration are most difficult to manage. Most eyes go blind despite multiple surgeries and use of latest instrumentation. In this video, we demonstrate the bimanual dissection of membranes using a newly designed instrument nicknamed Arrow. The membrane is grasped using an end gripping forceps and Arrow is used to dissect the membrane in the manner shown in this video. The pointed tip of the arrow creates a plane of dissection. It is then moved in a to and fro motion to separate the membrane from the retina. Its sharp lateral edges help to cut through the vascular epicenters present in the membrane. Arrow is a disposable, cannulated MVR-like instrument. It is shaped like a spear in the front with a pointed tip and sharp lateral edges. The shaft is long and curved to conform to the shape of the globe. The curved shape prevents any iatrogenic damage to lens and retina. It has got a small opening just behind its sharp tip. The arrow can be connected to a reusable handle which can be further connected to the extrusion pump of vitrectomy machine. This is helpful to remove excessive bleeding if it happens during surgery or to perform hydro or visco dissection. A 22-year female presented with PDR with extensive fibrovascular proliferation leading to tabletop closed funnel combined retinal detachment. Bimanual dissection using an end gripping forceps and arrow was done. The membrane which was looking difficult could be dissected in total using the simple to and fro motion of the hand. The patient regained a good 6 by 36 vision after removal of silicone oil. A 23 years male was diagnosed to have PDR with TRD and vitreous hemorrhage. His best corrected visual acuity was counting fingers at half meters. Three port pass plan of vitrectomy was done. Most of the dissection was done using vitreous cutter itself. End gripping forceps was also used to peel some membranes. At one point, we hit a roadblock and no further progress could be made either with the end gripping forceps or the vitreous cutter. This was the time we converted to by manual approach and used arrow for further dissection. The membrane removal which looked difficult became just a child's play. A 52-year male presented with PDR with tabletop TRD. There was a thick membrane over the posterior pole. A hole was created in the detached posterior hyaloid and peripheral vitreous was separated from the posterior membrane. Arrow was used to find proper plane of dissection. After initial separation of membrane from retina, further dissection was carried out using the vitreous cutter. Bevel tip of cutter was also used for blunt dissection of membrane.
Upon reaching a point where no further dissection was possible with the cutter, arrow was again used to create more openings for the cutter. Thereafter, the cutter and the arrow were used in tandem to remove the membrane without causing any damage to underlying retina. The arrow can be combined with scissors and vitrectomy cutter for efficient removal of membranes. Sometimes, the membranes lying in the upper hand corner are difficult to reach using your dominant hand. The non-dominant hand is then used for effective removal of membrane. Use of scissors and vitrectomy cutter with non-dominant hand is very difficult and leads to complications. This video demonstrates the ease of using arrow with the non-dominant hand. Since only the to and fro motion of hand is required, the membrane can be easily dissected using the non-dominant hand. We end this video with a sequence from the famous movie Shole, where the characters show that how success can be achieved using just an end gripping forceps and the arrow in these difficult and tough situations. Thank you. Thank you. Sangeet, that was pretty dramatic. <laughs> But we really enjoyed it. But, uh, you know, the acoustics are very bad in this hall. And there's a lot of echo, which yeah. is there. So, I want you to elucidate how you have created the arrow to the general public. Because they would be interested in knowing how to make it and how to use it. How to uh, create it? it. How, to, uh, how to cleave it? I couldn't hear because the Create sound it. Okay, uh, the design of the arrow started coming, uh, when I started using a 26 gauge needle for doing dissections. But the, there was a problem, the 26 gauge needles, one, it was not very long, then it was not curved. So doing a peripheral dissection became very, you could do it easily in the posterior pole, but periphery were not able to uh, get it properly. And it was not stout. It used to bend when you used to take it to the towards the periphery. So from that, I, 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 we started making a design of the arrow. We designed it to be a curved and a longer uh, instrument. So and and we thought that it, ha it should have the uh, features of both the cannula as well as the needle, so that if there is some bleeding while you are doing dissection, you can easily. Uh, take out the blood or if you want to do a hydro or visco dissection you can easily do that also with this so that's why that from there uh, the idea of arrow came into my mind Any questions? so it's attached to the extrusion right it is it is, it is ex you can attach it to the extrusion you can't but it, it depends upon you whether you want to get it okay. but you can attach it to the extrusion cannula to the extrusion cannula yes 
question. And it's, uh, you, you do it both for 23 and 25 or uh, 25 gauge? This was a 25 gauge uh, four port with technique. Beautiful videos. Sir. Thank Wonderful. you. Any Wonderful. Any questions? It's always audience. a pleasure to see your videos, sir. Thank you. Audience is also spellbound. <laughs> Audience is also spellbound. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's move on to Dr. Sonal Lakarala, run along. Uh, she's going to present some videos on uh, GRT and PDR. Thank you, Dr. Karobi, and uh, uh, to the team of A you. AIOC 23 for giving me this opportunity and okay. such stalwarts are presenting here. I think it's going to be quite challenging to put up these cases. Uh, can I have the audio please? So this is a 45 year old gentleman who had come to us with a giant retinal tear and a fake patient with a clear lens, didn't want to touch the lens. Uh, went ahead and uh, there was a coronal detachment associated, so went ahead to uh, do the surgery. So you see the large GRT and I've kind of, all the ports are made but the infusion port is uh, draining some coroidal fluid and you can see that I'm nudging and I'm not able to go inside so I changed the port position try and put a cutter which I know that is going through but every time my cannula would go into the subretinal space Still, the cannula is placed in this position, but when you see the vitrectomy started, a large mound comes in and you realize the entire cannula is going subretinal. Just to tell you that some patients like these have the entire pars plana off in the area of the GRT and you're left with nothing but putting a large, long 20-gauge uh, cannula in such patients so that you can stabilize the globe and get your infusion right inside. Once that's done, you put in your PFCL to stabilize your posterior pole like your third hand. You flatten the edge of the GRT. Uh, okay. Is this better? Yeah. And uh, you see the edge of the GRT on the temporal side is quite uh, uh, having a lot of intrinsic contraction. So it's kind of flattened with the help of a soft tip um, in with the PFCL in place. Uh, the extension at the GRT edges were again then lasered and there was a small retinectomy also done at these edges to flatten the retina very well over there. Uh, initially because of the GRT we couldn't see the optic nerve very well in this patient but eventually the optic nerve was like a, like a morning glory uh, syndrome. So this was the pre and the post stop of the patient and uh, you know you feel a little happy when you are doing this with a fake kick patient and with a clear lens. Uh, and such cases where the entire pars plana is off and you're always wondering how to get your infusion cannula inside. My second case is a case of um, bilateral PDR with a very similar kind of uh, fibrous proliferation right at the disc. And you see the entire prolif just sitting around the disc with completely sclerosed vessels. So um, yes, you can pick up the prolif like that also, but I would like to stain it with a blue dye so that I can get an edge. A proportional reflux in the Alcon constellation machine is very helpful in such cases to create a plane. Important point is to slowly pick up this fibrous prolif and instead of going from the disc outside, the reverse is taken into consideration. We are going from outside inwards so that you prevent more traction in the retina at every point. And then the remaining ILM is again stained and then the ILM is peeled off. So uh, you have to be very careful in such cases because in a lot of diabetics you'll have completely sclerosed vessels that you can see on the retina with a very thin atrophic retina and you do not want to deroof the macula at all in such cases. This was the post-op of his uh, left eye and then we went in the same way with his other eye and you see identical um, kind of a prolif right at the optic disc. The best is not to peel the prolif completely to the disc, but at the end, once you start peeling from outside inward and you come to the center of the disc, it's important to trim it off at that point instead of trying to pull over the disc and cause more bleeding. The 
entire retina was very very atrophic and all the vessels were extremely sclerosed so once you come here and once you finish the ilm peel it's important to trim this off on the disc and not try and peel it further sometimes a small part of the ilm can be left at the fovea with like a ilm sparing the fovea kind of a thing so that you do not deroof the fovea at all in such cases finally an endo laser is done in these patients and silicon oil is put simple surgeries but if done uh, in a systematic way i think you can achieve very good results for most of these patients this was his other eye and the patient achieved 618 vision in both the eyes thank you so much thank you sonil that was an excellent presentation and uh, 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 any questions from the audience or from paritosh sangeet any questions uh now we go over to supriya supriya is going to show us a few cases on phpv sorry um so i'm just going to show a few cases of phpv uh, as you can see uh, they, the baby, the children can come to you with leukocoria um, decreased vision tractional retinal detachments or vitreous hemorrhage this was a 2 year old uh, child with leukocoria with uh, who ended up with on b scan you could see the stalk from the disc to the lens vitreous hemorrhage um so what we did in these cases was a 23 gauge vitrectomy and uh, basically we um, did a lens sparing vitrectomy uh, of course an iol calculation is always done for these children in case there's some lens touch and you may need to convert it into a uh, um, you know irrigation aspiration and put in a lens so this was a bimanual dissection done under the microscope and you tease out the membrane it's like a vices ring tease out the posterior tissue to behind the lens from the posterior capsule and then cut it and once it gets cut from the posterior capsule then you can just trim the stalk this was uh, we were lucky it was a very uh, fibrous kind of phpv where there was not much blood and you can see this is the stalk from the lens to the uh, this and post surgery it had resolved um this is the second case where a 3 year old again uh, the stalk from the disc to the posterior capsule of the lens was there but there was no cataract so the challenge in these is to try and retain the lens so uh, uh, anterior vitrectomy was done again by manual under the microscope uh, where you tease out the uh, a uh, membrane from behind the lens push it posteriorly that gives you the cleavage point and then you can just cut it with your forceps So this is not a posterior polar cataract it's just the attachment of the posterior tag and once you release you can see how it falls back and then it was uh, a, a core vitrectomy was done and the this fibrous um connect to the disc was then uh, dissected use uh, using a cutter this was also not very uh, a vascular if it is then you have to make sure that you cauterize before you go around cutting and trimming it to the disc and then a core vitrectomy something like an rop you don't have to be very aggressive in your vitrectomy a core vitrectomy can done uh, can be done and a fluid air exchange was done so this is a th uh, three uh, two year old uh, child with leukocoria and this child had like a, a medusa head appearance multiple tags behind the lens as well as on the retina causing a macular detachment uh, this was also a lens vitrectomy so uh, similarly we did a, a vitrectomy just behind the lens pulled the uh, tissue from behind the lens these can be vascular sometimes and you have to ensure that you do a cautery otherwise it could just bleed into the eye and uh, make you lose your plane of uh, treatment so here as you pull the force uh, with the forceps you pull the tag posteriorly you snip it with your uh, with your scissors
and then using your cutter you can just trim the uh, tag and then come back and do a, a complete vitrectomy the, because this patient had a macular TRD we had to do a more extensive vitrectomy and release all the traction from the retina and once you release the traction then the retina uh, falls back into place so there is some tag here fibrous tissue but it was not in the central uh, pupillary area so we, it was left alone this is the pre-op uh, B scan and you can see in all these three patients the retina remains well attached and it's been a few years of follow-up and these none of these children have developed cataracts yet so um, I, I, I mean it's it's easy doing a, a lensectomy or a cataract surgery but the idea was to try and maintain the natural lens in these children because they were just two and three years old and and uh, we've successfully done that in these children. Yeah, thank you. So Priya, that was very nice, though I just saw part of it because I was arranging my uh, presentation. But what I wanted to say, do you get many a times cases where a PHPV has been mistaken for a cataract and they have done cataract extraction and come to you with a bleed? Do you get many cases, sorry? Is it echoing? Yes, yes, yes. That happen, happens often if an ultrasound careful evaluation preoperatively is not done. My question was that many a times PHPV gets mistaken for a cataract. A cataract surgery is done by somebody and the patient lands up with a bleed and then that's how the patient presents to us. So that's what I was asking Supriya if... Uh, this she has encountered at any point of time. So these three children that were presented, they all had a clear lens. So it was very easy to diagnose PHPV in them. But yes, we've had uh, uh, children who've come in with just leukocoria and then was told congenital cataract, taken up for surgery, you know, ended up with a messy surgery, a lot of bleed uh, intraoperatively and then sent to us with vitreous hemorrhage. So yes, we've had that. Uh, there's one question I wanted to ask you. See, PHPV generally is unilateral. It's not a bilateral condition. So what do you do in terms of rehabilitation for these children? So these children, of course, they undergo extensive amblyopia treatment post-operatively also. It's... Sorry? Speak into the mic. Yeah, so these children do undergo extensive amblyopia treatment post-operatively also. It's not that, you know, they're operated and then left alone. So they do come back for rehabilitation um, to the low visual aid clinic. No, what do you do? You use... Uh, so patching, you, patching or uh, uh, depending on how their vision is. Do you give them contact lenses? Because they are very small. So the contact lenses have to be managed by the parents. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, the child can't do it. It's unilateral. So the mother has to learn to put it, remove it, then, yeah. you know, to look after the child. So have you uh, come across some pitfalls that is there in the rehabilitation of these children? So, I mean, unlike ROP where you, you, are, you know, it's bilateral and you can give them glasses, this does become a challenge. Uh, but I think the pa parents are quite uh, made aware of and if we educate them well, then they do come back for follow-up and they do follow the strict regimen of uh, patching and contact lenses. Uh, because I have a very bad experience with these mothers. They uh, do it diligently in the first year or so, then it goes on a downslide and the child invariably comes back with a convergent squint later. Then you can always go in and put in a lens also in these uh, children. I mean, if you've left them a fake it, then you can always put in, once uh, things have settled down, then maybe in a year or two, you could put in a intraocular lens. A SFRL. Scleral fixated. Yes, SFRL, yes. Any other questions? Paritosh? Any incidents of cataract post-surgery and what is the longest follow-up you have? 
so uh, in these th three children no but it is yes sometimes if you are not able to separate it from the posterior capsule of the lens then intraoperatively your lens calculation is always done so that you are prepared uh, for it intraoperatively itself if at all there is a lens touch then you convert it into so the option of you know uh, having that is kept the, but you hope for it to not happen so yeah in uh, vitrectomy surgery for phpv what are chances of vitreous hemorrhage and how you tackle it there during Sorry. vitrectomy for this phpv hmm. how you tackle the, if there is some hemorrhage so you have to cauterize it well i mean make sure that every uh, vascular tuft that you see the feeder vessel yeah, is sure. cauterized I and i think if a well done cautery then really you can try and prevent it yeah, and uh, not cut so it nice. beyond the cauterized it edge then you can uh, try and prevent it but there are times when you've had a bleed and you've had to use pfcl and increase the intraocular pressure so yes thank you supriya thank you supriya and i would now like to invite dr karobi lahiri uh, she is going to talk to us on supracoroidal hemorrhage and stage 5 rop an open sky vitrectomy Good afternoon. Uh, I am going to present two cases in front of you. Uh, the first is a 65-year-old female patient. She is a diabetic, hypertensive. She had cholesterol issues. She IHD. CABG was done on her. She is on anti-hypertensives, anti-diabetic medications, on statins, and double blood thinners. Now she had history of cataract surgery for rock hard brown cataract surgery. She had a nucleus drop. which was followed by vitrectomy pfcl and pfcl extraction of the uh, nucleus and uh, there was an onset of a supracoroidal bleed at that point of time which was then operated 15 days later so let's go over to the surgery now this was after the first uh, uh, when the uh, supracoroidal bleed occurred so this was the usg and this was the usg done a few days later where it showed an evidence of uh, there was no evidence of retinal detachment and it was just a bullous kind of choroidal detachment which was seen so this is the surgery of the patient the hard nucleus had a drop into the vitreous cavity the fragmentum was unable to cut it effectively so a pfcl extraction was planned and pfcl was put behind the uh, behind the uh, uh, this uh, nucleus and it was removed through the limbus as you see that there is a whole lot of hard rock hard nuclear fragment coming out and when we are stroking the sin you can see the bleed coming in so that was the onset of the supracoroidal bleed which was there the eye was closed and 15 days later this eye was taken for a release of blood you see the dark fluid which is coming out dark blood and this is when you go inside there are a lot of membranes which are formed inside the eye you clear it up effectively the retina is in is in its place and uh, you can give a, a successful end point to a rather gruesome kind of looking surgery now the next patient is a preterm born at 28 weeks with a birth weight of 890 grams the eye of this child though it was in the city of mumbai was not examined at all at the time uh, from birth right up to the time that the child uh, was 3 months or 4 months of age where the parents noticed a white reflex and they went from doctor to doctor and finally they came to us at the 8th month where we saw that the child had a stage 5 rop with a total corneal opacity just the periphery could be could was uh, clear where you could see that he had a shallow ac and the usg showed a closed funnel configuration of uh, the uh, rop so this is how the condition was of the patient and this had needed a keratoplasty so that is a flaringer's ring which has been put and then 
we go ahead and you see how thick the cornea is and separated from the iris and the uh, lens uh, uh, has been removed and there you see the dissection of the fibrovascular tissue from the retina the whitish appearing substances are the uh, fibrovascular tissues and this is where we are trying to open up the funnel in an open sky configuration you have to go carefully and separate all the membranes because it's not only stuck at the center there are membranes in between too carefully dissect out all the adhesions the blood which aggregates in the center and then afterwards you put in your high viscosity solution and suture the lens in place uh, suture the cornea in place so the inference is however bad it looks if the ch person has a chance never give up thank you from the yes okay for the first case so you uh, you waited for 15 days stage the surgery in the sense uh, uh, do you uh, leave the pfc inside the eye for some time for the retina to completely flatten and then you uh, no, remove it or no now do you do a stage surgery or a single surgery when you are doing for the second time because we inject pfcl and leave it inside the eye for 10 15 no, days no i didn't get your question for the first case the expulsive yes. hemorrhage yes when you operated for the expulsive hemorrhage after 15 days uh, into the vitreous cavity you inject the pfcl and leave it for some time so that the entire blood uh, in the suprachoroidal spaces you don't do it i have not injected pfcl no, no i am asking case. do you i am asking no no no, no i don't do that for i the, leave the infusion on and made the opening on the outside drained off all the fluid and then went and did the vitrectomy from inside and for the second case the force i mean scissors used was uh, a curved it, curved horizontal scissors yeah uh, quite a big uh, so it was done under magnification the surgery or under the, the microscope under. any other thank questions you, thank you ma'am <clears throat> should i invite uh, but yeah so yeah. that would be classified as a stage 5c rop no ma'am now with the corneal changes and all pardon so in the current classification of rop that would be stage 5c yes 5c so so you would i mean even 5c you've operated yeah <laughs> that's amazing never give up yeah superb thank that was wonderful ma'am so the curved vertical scissors uh were designed by uh, yours truly and made by dork uh, it was 25 years ago the going is more now less okay um, at the outset i'd like to thank uh, dr karobi because she dr karobi actually split her 5 minutes into 3 for herself and 2 for me so that this case could be uh, incorporated so thank you very much karobi um let's play the video so this is a 77 year old patient uh, who refused to uh, agree uh, that he had uh, he wasn't seeing in one eye and presented very late uh, though there was perception of light and uh, projection was accurate there was a narrow posterior funnel uh, there were no obvious membranes to be peeled i tried with the pick the diamond dusted scraper the uh, macular tissue was contracted i tried ilm peeling here you can see in the oct sections so i put in pfcl finally a base excision was done and uh, there were folds uh, persistent at the macula 
under the PFCL. So I did a ILM peeling under the PFCL. And lo and behold, most of the folds cleared up. Very central, uh, I mean, all these inner and middle retinal folds, mid retinal folds seem to have cleared up. Very central contraction did persist. I tried ILM peeling there also. With danger of bleeding which would have made the situation worse so finally I filled it up with PFCL massaged the peri ONH retina endo laser FGE and then finally uh, silicon oil air exchange was performed this was a pseudo-faking eye so it prevent air was injected and by the 10th day this eye surprisingly had uh, 6 by 36 and 36 uh, vision. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So you're planning another so surgery basically, on the... Yeah, yeah, this is going to be a work in progress. The retina is fully attached just now. Uh, some of those contracted folds, they will settle. Eventually, I know that it's going to get re-detached at places, but then I'll be spaced with more mature membranes. Uh, even there, there's going to be requirement of retinectomies at certain places where the contractor just doesn't release. Uh, but uh, the macula has been preserved. Central vision, which is what we use most of the time, has uh, reasonably been achieved. And uh, it's going to be work in progress, but I think... Uh, uh, I mean, we've been able to achieve a reasonably good result in our... Currently, if it's maintaining, it's best to just watch it. Yeah, now the retina is attached, you know, under oil. It's just about uh, now would be the second week going on. So, but I'm sure it's going to re-detach eventually. There are going to be areas of uh, puckering and uh, I'll have to go in again. So, we'll see at that time. But it will be a quieter eye. Uh, the risk of bleeding at the time of retinectomies will be lesser. There will be more mature membranes uh, present uh, to be removed, if any, and uh, then I'll be able to... Do you use uh, methotrexate in these cases to prevent any further... No, no, no I, I have not been using methotrexate, but I use triamcinolone. Uh, triamcinolone at the beginning of the surgery... Uh, to stain the vitreous, some particles invariably remain and uh, sometimes in these bad PVR cases I even inject uh, intravitreally at the end of the surgery even if I have put in oil. So they help to slow down the PVR process, uh, the, the inflammation basically or I may just inject it as a posterior subtenance, uh, deep posterior subtenance tramps and along. So I have found that to be useful. Any comments from the audience or any questions? Sir, this is my question to you. You said you leave in PFCL in the eye. How long do you leave the PFCL? No, theoretically we can leave the PFCL inside the eye for 21 days without any damage. But usually we leave it for maybe 7 to 10 days. That's it. And uh, do you put the patient on oral steroids? Or no, anything? Nothing, no, nothing, nothing. No, not much of a problem happens with the PFCL. But usually we'll top it up with the silicon oil Speaking so that the, the movement of the, uh, what do you call the PFCL is limited. Okay. So it doesn't create much problem. Okay. Yes, problem. I have a question. Uh, in the stage 5 ROP surgery, how do you ensure that the globe doesn't collapse? And uh, I would like to know your uh, no, visual outcomes or overall out outcomes uh, in your experience. Post-surgery, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, what happens is that when we have a stage 5, which is almost stage 5C now, as per the new classification, you have a entity like that where you're going to have a K-plasty, which you have to do because the cornea doesn't allow you any kind of visibility. You have to prognosticate these patients or the parents very well because uh, they don't run the uh, this of having very good vision at the most 8% to 10% would improve with an anatomical settlement. 
those people who get anatomically settled that 8 to 10% again the viability of the cornea whether it remains clear or opaque would be another decisive factor in the visual outcome but by and large suppose we don't do a patient with a graft we just do the stage 5 surgery and we give them an 8% uh, chance of anatomical replacement we tell them that their visibility can be anywhere from just pl to pr to hand movements and if they are very lucky it could go to a few feet 1 2 3 feet means if there is mostly that condition is bilateral both the eyes are generally affected in the similar fashion so even if you get that measure of vision in an eye in one eye if one works out and the other doesn't work out you still the patient can just ambulate will not will have some light perception it's not a dark world for the child so you have to prognosticate accordingly if it's a open sky i mean if it's an open funnel you can give a give a better prognosis of about 20 25% but if it's a closed funnel you have to give them the works about the prognostication of the anatomical as well as, as, well as the visual prognosis <coughs> Uh, if there are no more questions dr naresh any comments i think i would like to uh, close uh, this uh, session over here and uh, i say thank you to all my co speakers and uh, people on the panel sangeet who doesn't come and sit over here but is sitting over there with his arrow and all the delegates who have attended so nicely and uh, encouraged all of us thank you so much